Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 91 to 95. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 91, 92, 93, 94, and 95. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 91, we were asked to rank the following compounds in order of the most acidic to least acidic. So rank them from most acidic to least acidic. And what we're talking about is they're all some form of variation on a benzoic acid. So benzoic acid looks like this. We have a benzene. Attached to that, we have a carboxylic acid. So number two is actually benzoic acid. That's what the structure looks like and then the rest are just variations for example if we look at number one this is what it looks like this is number one p chlorobenzoic acid if you know aromatic rings and you know the different positions you should know this for organic chemistry you know that p represents para there's also m for meta and then o for ortho and that's all in relative position to the main function group that we're talking about in this case the highest priority would be the carboxylic acid so Relative to the carboxylic acid on the para position, there's a chloride in number one. So it's p-chlorobenzoic acid. So what mainly changed is we added something which we can call a withdrawing group because it draws electron density towards itself. In option three, we have a donating group. At the para position now we have a methyl which will donate electron density to this aromatic system. And then finally, we have the nitro which would be an actual strong withdrawing group relative to the other one, the chloride, this is a stronger withdrawing group. And so what's going on here is that when this acid is deprotonated, it'll have a negative charge on the oxygen. First of all, we'll have some resonance going on within the carboxylic acid, but the electron density can also be diffused throughout the rest of the molecule towards the aromatic ring. And then if we add a withdrawing group, that can pull more electron density towards itself. What that does is it stabilizes this conjugate base that's formed when we have deprotonation, which means that the acid is more likely to be deprotonated, so it's a stronger acid. It's more acidic. So a withdrawing group would make it more acidic, and a donating group would do the opposite effect. It would donate more electron density to something which is already electron dense because of the negative charge on that oxygen, and so that would stabilize that conjugate base. So in this case, the most acidic is going to be withdrawing, and we said that the nitro group is more withdrawing, that NO2 group, more strongly withdrawing than the chloride. So therefore, our most acidic is going to be number four. So we can remove options A and D. We're choosing between now B and C. Option four is the most acidic. Option three is going to be the least acidic because it has that donating group. And then we just need to differentiate between one and two. Well, one is just a normal benzoic acid. It's going to be more acidic than the methyl but it's going to be less acidic than the chloride because the chloride is still a withdrawing group, not as strong as the NO2, but it's still withdrawing and having that variation on just like relative to just a normal benzoic acid, it would once again, like I said, stabilize that conjugate base. So it's going to be more acidic. So B is our correct answer because we're saying number four is the most acidic and then the chloro one, that is more acidic than the normal benzoic acid. And then finally, number three is the least acidic. In question 92, it says, while monitoring a reaction, a student gathers the IR spectra at different time points. A strong broad peak at 3200 is slowly replaced with a strong sharp peak at 1750 upon completion of the reaction. Now we're asked which of the following conversions has most likely occurred. So a reaction is taking place. We're looking at the IR spectra. We see that there was a strong broad peak at 3200, and now it's replaced with something else. So that's a conversion that took place strong sharp peak at 1750 which specific conversion of one functional group to another took place for this you need to know some of the key points that show up in an ir spectra you don't have to know too many for the mcat but there are some key ones that you should know and these two are definitely ones that you should know so it's not option a it's, it's pretty difficult to look at these cc individual bonds and then this cc double bond it would be around 1600, but it wouldn't be like a strong sharp peak that we're seeing at 1750. That's cor corresponding to a different functional group. 
And in option D, we don't really talk about the C double bond N. That's not really something you have to know for the MCAT. So it's between B and C. And when you see something that's a strong broad peak, the broadness, often it comes from hydrogen bonding. So the thing which hydrogen bonds is an OH. So know this specifically, the strong broad peak at 3200, it's an OH group, the hydroxide. And then the strong sharp peak is a double bonded oxygen. At 1750, you should definitely know that that's a carbonyl peak. So what's going on is we're seeing disappearance of the 3200, and then we're seeing appearance of the, the 1750. So that means C is our correct answer. B is incorrect because it's implying that it's going the other way. In question 93, we're asked which of the following pairs of molecules would be most easily separated by liquid chromatography with a nonpolar stationary phase and a polar mobile phase. What really matters here is that we're talking about liquid chromatography and we're talking about a nonpolar and a polar phase. It doesn't matter really which one's stationary or mobile. We're separating molecules based on polarity. That means that if they have similar polarity, this is not the right method to use. Option A is talking about D and L alanine. So the D and L is just talking about the stereochemistry, and these two are mirror images of each other or enantiomers. And what that means is that the 3D orientation in space is different, but otherwise the actual linkages between atoms within the molecule is the same. Therefore, it's going to behave the same. It's going to have similar physical properties, including polarity. So we can't use liquid chromatography to separate them. We can't use this type of liquid chromatography to separate them based on the polarity. So that would not work. Same thing with B. We have two propanol and one propanol. All we really did is just move the position of the hydroxide group. Otherwise, we still have the three carbons. We have one OH group. It's going to have similar properties. Definitely the polarity is going to be the same or very similar. And therefore, we can't separate based on this feature. But option C does make sense. First of all, just like with option A, we can remove option D. They're an antimer, so they're going to behave similarly. But free fatty acid and phospholipid, the free fatty acid it has a carboxylic acid group at the end. And that's going to be negatively charged, so that's going to be it's going to be polar. And then it really depends on the length of the fatty acid chain we're talking about. That depends and it determines the, the polarity that we see. If it's a short fatty acid, then it's going to be more of a polar molecule. If it's a if it's a longer fatty acid, then there's some non-polarity as well. And then with the phospholipid, similar thing. It has a polar part and a non-polar part, but depending on what we're talking about, if we know more specifics, we can know exactly like what their polarity would be. But even without knowing that, you can know that these are molecules which differ based on polarity. They're not like the same thing that have the same polarity. And therefore we can separate these based on that property. In question 94, we're asked which of the following holds true regarding conformational isomers. So what's true about conformational isomers? So conformational isomers means we're talking about things, we're talking about one molecule, but then the different orientations that it can exist in. For example, when you look down from one bond, when you're looking at one atom connected to another atom and you're looking down that bond, it can be in the anti-staggered or gauche conformation. So option A is saying they contain less similarity than stereoisomers. That would actually be false. If we're talking about stereoisomers like enantiomers and diastereomers, those actually differ more because they're talking about they're talking about compounds which have an even greater difference in the orientation of the bonds in 3D space. And especially if we're talking about diastereomers, they might have some pretty different properties, whereas enantiomers show similar properties. But either way, when we're talking about a conformational isomer, we're literally talking about just one molecule. It could be just like one form of an enantiomer and how that changes along a bond, the orientation of groups around a bond. So since we're just talking about one molecule instead of a pair, this is going to be definitely more similar. And option B is saying it eclipse conformation is always less favorable than staggered. That's not something which is always true. So for example, if we have something that looks like this and it's eclipsed, if there are two groups that could hydrogen bond with each other, then it's possible that they might 
still favor this eclipse confirmation. So if there's like one example of a situation is when we have hydrogen bonding between certain groups, that would cause them to come together. And even though there's a steric strain, the hydrogen bonding factor might be more important. So it's not always true that eclipsed is, more, is less favorable than staggered because we have seen some reactions that take place. And when we try to explain them based on the mechanism and this conformational isomer part comes in play, then we see that, okay, we would think that, okay, eclipsed is sterically hindered, so it shouldn't go like this. But based on the results that we see, the products, the only mechanism that makes sense is if it went through the eclipse conformation and something which could favor that is hydrogen bonding. There are also different types of bonding that could also favor this. But the point is B is not always true. We're looking for something that's true. C is saying they all exist at the same energy state. That's definitely not true. So eclipse, staggered, gauche, they exist at different energy states. Therefore, we are going to say D, none of the above for this question. In question 95, it says diols have higher boiling points than their corresponding alcohols with only one hydroxyl group because diols blank. So we're comparing diols to the alcohol, the corresponding with just alcohol with just one hydroxyl group. So for example, if we had a three carbon chain with one OH versus three carbon chain with two OHs, the one that's a diol and has two OHs would have a higher boiling point. So it's the boiling point that's the main thing that we're talking about. Why is that? So boiling point, keep in mind, is because of if we have a solution of a bunch of of many of the same molecules, so many of the diol or the the single alcohol, then the boiling point is dependent on breaking them apart from each other, breaking the molecules apart from each other. So we're talking about intermolecular attractions. So how the molecules attract and behave and interact with each other. There's going to be a lot of hydrogen bonding in both of them. But with the diols, we have more hydrogen bonding happening, right? Because we have two places on a single molecule that that can happen. And it doesn't really matter about intramolecular things. So option A is saying it can self-associate to form hydrogen bond. A diol, yes, it could have an intramolecular hydrogen bond that takes place between the two OHs. But that's not nearly as important as the intermolecular attractions. So that's more so what we're looking for. B is saying it can dissociate more easily in solution. No, alcohols, they don't really dissociate well in solution. We need some basic compound to make that happen, to make them be deprotonated. So a diol, no, it's not. There's nothing about a diol that makes it more likely to dissociate. C is saying it can form intermolecular bonds at two sides of the molecule rather than just one. And yes, that's the main thing. Remember, if you're ever talking about boiling point, we're talking about intermolecular bonds. And finally, D is saying that they lack a positive charge. That's incorrect. Sure, they do lack a positive charge, but so does the single hydroxyl alcohol. And that's not really that's not really what we're talking about here, right? Whether it has a charge or not, it can still have dipoles happening, which aren't full charges, but they're they're part charges, they're partly charged, these delta charges, and that can still lead to intermolecular attractions and then differences in boiling point. So C is the best answer here. And that's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here, as well as in the description below. And in that course, just like in this video, we go through a lot of questions, explaining what the question is asking you, as well as going through all the different answer options and breaking down why each one is correct or incorrect so that you have the right type of thinking for the MCAT. Other than that, make sure to subscribe here to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. And that's it for